here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place, The Lord Will Provide. As it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you, and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of the heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We speak together. O come, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. The epistle reading and the basis for the message this morning is from James chapter 1. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of firstfruits of his creatures. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We stand for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the first chapter. Glory be to thee. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. The Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness forty days, being tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild animals and the angels were ministering to him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise be to thee, O Christ. We confess our Christian faith together in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven 
and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated for the sermon hymn number 438, A Lamb Goes On Complaining For. Thank you. 
Bibles this morning can open up to James chapter 1, where James is writing about standing firm under trial and temptation. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm going to ask all of you a question, but you don't have to raise your hands because, well, we're Lutherans and we keep our hands firmly by our sides. No hand raising or clapping for us. Here's my question for you. How many of you had a New Year's resolution? How's it going? It's been 52 days since New Year's Day. 52 days is a long time. And I don't see too many smiles or nods that it's going all that well. Well, let me ask you another question, and maybe this will help drive the point home a little more strongly. How many of you decided to give up something for Lent? Well, today is the fifth day of Lent. How is that going? Probably about the same. Resolutions are hard, not necessarily because we take on more than we can handle, although that's probably the problem sometimes. The problem is that there are temptations everywhere. Decided to eat less sugar? Well, try going into Casey's to pay for your gas and not wanting to buy a donut or 12. Resolve to lose weight? Well, McDonald's is on the way home and it's just so cheap. Desire to get more serious about your spiritual life? Well, there's just too many distractions and temptations that demand my attention. Plus, if we fall from what we're trying to do, we can always just say, the devil made me do it. Our epistle lesson for this first Sunday of Lent is about temptations. But James isn't writing about sugar and spice and everything nice. James is talking about temptations, like those pictures or those videos that you can find so easily on your screen or that relationship that can easily cross the line, or those customers that are just so ignorant that they deserve to be overcharged, or that person who is just so ripe to be gossiped about. Temptations are everywhere, and they're constant. We know what it is to be tempted, and we know who it is that's doing the tempting. It's not God, of course, and James reminds us of this fact. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. No, it's not God who tempts us, but our old evil foe. From our earliest ancestors to us, and even to Jesus, Satan does his darndest to place that shiny, tasty, eye-opening fruit in front of our eyes. What's surprising about James's writing, though, is that he talks not about Christians being tempted because we know we will be tempted. What's really striking for us is how he begins our reading for today. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. And even though it's only verse 12 of the first chapter, this is already the second time that James has spoken in this way. He said back in verse 2, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. How can we count it to be joy when we're under trial? How can James call us blessed when we're being tempted and tried? Even more blessed or blessed is an unusual greeting for the beginning of Lent. Lent is a season of contrition and repentance. It's a season of dust and ashes, a season of sackcloth and mourning. It doesn't seem like a season of blessing at all. We have a cross here, after all, the sign of punishment and death. For heaven's sake, this is not a season of joy or blessing. We've even buried our alleluias for the season. And if there's one thing that we know for certain during the season of Lent, it's that we've failed. we failed because, as we just confessed, we are poor, miserable sinners. So we failed because of who we are, and we failed because of what we've done. 
We haven't remained steadfast under trial. We haven't lived up to God's will for our lives. But it's in our gospel reading in Mark chapter 1 that Mark points us to the good news that we need to hear. That's because he points us to Jesus. And for just two short verses, Mark reminds us that after the Spirit drove Jesus into the wilderness, Jesus was tempted by Satan for 40 days. Despite the conditions, despite Satan's constant attacks against him, our Lord Jesus Christ overcame our old wily foe, triumphed over him. And he did so for us. What the people of Israel couldn't do in 40 years in the wilderness, Jesus did in 40 days. What we aren't able to do perfectly at any point in our lives, Jesus does through his entire life. This is good news because we know that it's not through our efforts that we find the blessing of the crown of eternal life. But it's through Jesus' faithfulness that God blesses us and gives us the crown. Our enemy, the devil, didn't stand a chance because no matter the trial, it was Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who relying on his Father's word endured. So it's our connection to him, our connection to Jesus Christ, the victor over sin and death that brings us blessing and life from God. Christ's life was for us, for us in our place, that we might have his righteousness, that we might have his blessing, that we might live with him forever. So when we see Jesus hungry and dirty and overheated and sickly and even maybe close to death, we don't see a tragedy. We see the triumph of Jesus' fortitude and God's plan for our salvation. It should come as less and less a surprise to us than when we hear James or when we hear Jesus bless those who do not look blessed by the world. Jesus can bless the poor in spirit, for example, at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, because these people, the poor in spirit, know that they bring nothing to their salvation. Jesus can bless those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, because in Jesus they will be satisfied. Jesus can even bless those who are reviled and persecuted because Jesus says he was reviled and persecuted first. And because of his crucifixion, we have now received a great reward from our Father in heaven. This is why James can bless those who are facing trials of all kinds, because in Christ they find their steadfastness to endure. All this still leaves a practical question, though, doesn't it? If temptation will surely come, and it will come, what do we do when we're tempted? Well, we shouldn't sit around and wait for it to go away, because we know that the devil is never tired of trying to get us to sin. Certainly, we shouldn't consider sin something to be indulged in, as if, well, God will forgive me anyway. God doesn't tempt us, but we shouldn't certainly turn around and tempt God with our sin. So what should we do? Well, the Apostle Paul writes that we should flee. And that's certainly good advice, right? He says in 1 Corinthians 6, flee from sexual immorality. And in chapter 10, flee from idolatry. In 1 Timothy 6, he says, flee from conceit and from the love of money. In 2 Timothy 2, flee youthful passions. If you've ever seen anything or maybe even experienced for yourself anything regarding drug addiction, you know what this looks like. I remember a long time back watching this show about this woman who was addicted to a nasty drug and she spent thousands of dollars a day to feed her addiction. Now, thankfully, she was rescued and brought to a rehab center where over months at a time, she went through this detox and was brought back to this healthy state. But did you know that something like 9 out of 10 people who are brought out of addiction fall back into addiction because they simply go back to the same situation they were in before, surrounded by the same people, the same struggles, and the same 
drugs. Shouldn't surprise us then that Paul tells us to flee, get out of the situation. What's interesting though, is that in Mark's gospel, this temptation of Jesus, this account is only two verses long, and unlike Matthew and Luke, Mark never says anything about the devil fleeing. Jesus' whole ministry then is marked by confrontation with the devil and with his minions. He's casting out demons, he's facing off against the Pharisees and leaders who are in league with Satan, and he's constantly, constantly under trial. And of course, as Jesus says, a disciple is not above his master. So we, dear Christians, will face trial. The devil hasn't gone away after Jesus' crucifixion. He continues to attack us. The devil doesn't have to explicitly tempt us, though, does he? James' words here in chapter 1 of his letter are not about being tempted by the devil. Instead, James writes about being tempted by the desires of our hearts. Remember Jesus said back in Mark chapter 7, what goes into a person doesn't make him unclean, but what comes out. For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality and theft, murder and adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. You see, you can go as far away from temptation as you want. You can flee from sexual immorality and idolatry and covetousness, but you can't escape your own heart. That's a problem. So what do we do about that? It's important for us to consider our desires because that's the deeper problem, isn't it? So for the woman, for example, who was addicted to drugs, it would be important for her not to come back to the same situation with the same people in the same house surrounded by the same trials. But say you move away, what is still going to follow you but your desire, your addiction, that little voice in your head that says, you know, things are just a little stressful right now, so I just need a little bit. Spiritually, things aren't any different. In fact, they're even harder. We can take ourselves out of situations that might lead us to sin, and that's what we should absolutely do. But will that take care of the deeper problem? And the answer is, not entirely. James talks about evil desires in the terms of being deceived. Desires are unnatural. Desires can be sinful in and of themselves. Passions are deceiving, he says in verse 16. So that can be true physically, right? So my desire for sugar, for example. Sugar is tasty, but ultimately for my body, it leaves me empty. Or maybe my passion for something. I can have a certain expectation, or I think I have a certain calling, but my passion for something, what will that eventually drive me to do? It can be overtly sinful, of course, like a passion for adultery, which might feel good at the time until it doesn't. Satan is the father of lies, and he plays into our passions. Just think about our first mother and father in the garden. When he speaks to Eve, trying to get her to eat the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he tells her that she will become like God, knowing good and evil. She plays to her passion for wanting to be like God. And so when she looks at that fruit, she sees that it's desirable for food, desirable to the eye, and desirable for gaining knowledge. Desire, 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 this passion to have something that God hasn't given to us. And so we deceive ourselves into sinning. Again, with food, well, I've given up sugar, but you know what, well, this one little thing won't hurt me. Or adultery. Well, it's just a picture, right? Or looking but not touching, right? Or what about being in the Word? Reading the Bible? Well, I have other more important things I need to be doing. Or even coming to church. It's simply more convenient not 
to be here. You see, bad habits take 18 to wait for it, 254 days to break. Something that can only take once to form a habit, taking one drink or doing drugs one time or committing adultery once. Something that only takes one slip up can take three weeks to almost a year to break. So what do we do? Well, it's important for us then as Christians to cultivate healthy desires, healthy habits, healthy practices. In his book titled, Thank, Praise, Serve, and Obey, Recover the Joy of Piety, Pastor Will Whedon explores the joys of a healthy Christian piety. He lists eight Christian habits or actions that are all a part of a healthy Christian piety. They range from frequent reception of the Lord's Supper to regular confession of sins to giving of our money to other good works that a Christian would do. And I could easily preach a sermon on every single one of them, but I just want to focus on two to close out the message this morning. The first two, the most important ones that he lists, are reading the Word and praying. In Colossians chapter 3, Paul spends 16 verses echoing what James tells us here in chapter 1 of his letter. He gives us a list of exactly what to avoid, these unhealthy, sinful, evil desires. And he tells us what desires are godly ones, the things that we should be cultivating. But he ends in verse 16 with how to do it. Paul says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the famous German theologian from the last century, wrote this about the word. Why do I meditate? Because I am a Christian. Therefore, every day in which I do not penetrate more deeply into the knowledge of God's word and holy scripture is a lost day for me. I can only move forward with certainty upon the firm ground of the Word of God. And as a Christian, I learn to know Holy Scripture in no other way than by hearing the Word preached and by prayerful meditation. Peter said to Jesus at the end of John chapter 6, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And in John, 1 John chapter 1, John calls Jesus the Word of life. Being in the Word means being connected to Jesus, which gives us life. So firstly, and most importantly as Christians, we should be cultivating a daily habit of being in God's Word, because it is quite literally a matter of life and death. Secondly, we should pray. The psalmist writes, I rise before dawn and cry for help. I hope in your words, my eyes are awake before the watches of the night, that I may meditate on your promise. Meditation on God's word, prayer on God's word, seeking God's will and God's comfort through prayer is so important to us as Christians. So important that even Jesus, the Son of God, took time to pray, to find rest in his Father. He would go off into a mountainside alone and he would pray by himself. These habits are important, but they don't come easily. Good habits can take weeks or months or even years to establish. So for us, we shouldn't expect that things change overnight. We should start small and work our way up. Maybe a few minutes a day, every day, and then add five minutes more or ten minutes more. Maybe most importantly, what we need to do is set a time in our schedule to do these things. Yes, to schedule time in God's Word, to schedule time to pray, because if we schedule it, nothing else can take precedence. And if we're in God's Word, and if we're praying, it's only through the power of Christ, through these things, that we can remain steadfast under trial, because trials will come. It will come from the devil, and they'll certainly come from our own hearts. And there's always something else that we could be doing. But remaining steadfast doesn't mean never stumbling. Remaining devoted 
even despite the fact that we might fail and fall, remaining devoted, keeping on doing it. This is what helps us to grow closer to Jesus Christ. James says in chapter 4, He gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. Remember, as we sing so boldly, one little world, word can fell the devil. The word of Christ. Come soon, Lord Jesus. Amen. I mean, the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We stand and sing together the offertory. today we continue to remember those uh, for whom God has blessed with another birthday and anniversary. We remember those who are sick and ill and homebound, and we add to our homebound list uh, Leland Borkhart, who is now at Faith Home in Osage, and also remember his wife Betty, who has been in the hospital for a few days, having had stents put in her heart. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you would have all to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. By your almighty power and unsearchable wisdom, break and hinder all the counsels of those who hate your word and who by corrupt teaching would destroy it. Enlighten them with the knowledge of your glory that they may know the riches of your heavenly grace and in peace and righteousness serve you, the only true God. O God, source of all abiding knowledge, through word and spirit you both enlighten the minds and sanctify the lives of those whom you draw to your service. Look with favor on the seminaries and colleges of the church. We give you thanks this week especially that the Reverend Dr. Thomas Egger has accepted the call to serve as president of Concordia Seminary in St. Louis. And we ask you to bless those who teach, bless those who learn, that all the baptized may apply themselves with ready diligence to their tasks and faithfully fulfill their service according to your will. O Lord, our God, in holy baptism, you have called us to be Christians and granted us the remission of sins. Make us ready to receive the most holy body and blood of Christ for the forgiveness of all of our sins, and grant us grateful hearts that we may give thanks to you, O Father, both now and forever. Almighty and everlasting God, through your Son you have promised us forgiveness of sins and everlasting life. Govern our hearts by your Holy Spirit, that in our daily need, and especially in times of temptation, we may seek your help, and by a true and lively faith in your word, obtain all that you have promised. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, you have blessed us with the joy and care of children. Give us calm strength and patient wisdom, that as they grow in years, we may teach them to love whatever is just and true and good, following the example of our Savior. Jesus Christ. Father of mercies and God of all, comfort our only help in time of need. Look with favor upon your servants who are ill, homebound, hospitalized, and recovering, imprisoned, or otherwise in need. This morning especially, we lift up to you your servants, Leland and Betty. Assure them of your mercy. Deliver them from the temptations of the evil one, and give them patience and comfort in their situations. 
If it please you, restore them to health and freedom. Give them grace to accept their tribulations with courage and with hope. O oh Lord Jesus, your mercies are new every morning. We thank you for another year of married life together for Josh and Abby. Open their hearts always to receive more of your love, that their love for each other may never grow weary, but deepen and grow through every joy and sorrow shared. Heavenly Father, our times are in your hands. Look with favor on Crystal and Mary and Sadie as they celebrate their birthdays this week. Grant that they may continue to grow in wisdom and grace. Strengthen their trust in your goodness and bless them with your abiding love all the days of their lives. These and all things we bring before you, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning to everyone watching at home today, and good morning to all of you kids. It's good to have you here with us this morning. I hope that you've been taking advantage of those wonderful packets that Mrs. Wold has been sending home for all of you. And this week, I want to give you a little introduction to what you'll be learning. You'll be learning about Genesis chapter 25, about Jacob and Esau. They were brothers, and they weren't just brothers, they were twin brothers. So there would be a lot of fighting that was going on. Okay, but Esau was the older brother. He was born first. Now I see a lot of you have older siblings. And you know what? I'm an older sibling, so I don't understand this. But my wife, well, she's a second one, so she really understands this. Sometimes those older brothers and sisters, they get the favor, don't they? Their parents like to give them a little extra. Maybe is that how you feel sometimes? Maybe you think they like them a little more? That's how Jacob felt. He thought his parents loved Esau more. But God gives Isaac and Rebekah, that's Jacob and Esau's parents, a promise. He says that it's not going to be Esau that gets all the stuff. It's going to be the younger one. It's going to be Jacob. But that doesn't mean, oh, well, God loves Jacob more. He doesn't love Esau, like we might feel like sometimes with our own parents. No, it means that God sees those who think that, oh, nobody loves me, nobody likes me, everything's not good, and he lifts them up. So when you're listening this week, when you're reading, when you're learning, I want you to think about how good God is to us. That even though Jesus is God's only son, that God gives us all the good gifts that Jesus deserves because Jesus was faithful by dying on the cross and rising again. And I want you to think about with your parents all the good gifts that God gives to us through Jesus. Service of the sacrament begins on page 194. Please rise. The Lord be with you. right and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who overcame the assaults of the devil and gave his life as a ransom for many, that with cleansed hearts we might be prepared joyfully to celebrate the Paschal Feast in sincerity and truth. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing.
art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. 